Welcome to this episode of the Down the Pool Podcast, this cheery, happy episode of the Down the Pool Podcast. Uh, welcome back, Gary. Um, what a win. <laughs> I know, mate. Fantastic. I've got my I've got my Guinness in a Halifax Wanderers glass to celebrate. Love it. Um, good mood all week. Yeah, it's brilliant. I think we're, we're probably the best team in the world, I'd say. Us or Man City. I, I definitely think so. I, like to be honest with you, if Haaland had seen this performance, he probably would have moved to Halifax rather than Manchester. To be honest, Mate, with you. Ma- Matty Fegan, give him a call. Is yeah, is, is going to sign? I, He's interested. Well, a big time. Well, this could be. You know, we have the the big signing coming True. July the seventh. So fingers crossed. Get a do preseason yeah. with us, banging a few goals against Forge. Yeah, he'll be flying when the league starts in England. <laughs> But it, it was it was the complete 180 of what happened against Forge. And I feel, I mean, um, it, it's just, it's been amazing. It was an amazing game to watch. Uh, I watched the uh, Kai Brady's with the good folks from the Block 108. And I had a, a great time. There was a good crowd there singing some songs. I know the privateers had their own thing at the, uh, the free house. One of my favorite things about that's happening now is that there's watch parties because before the away games were kind of dead and mm. you'd kind of just either watch it at home or go to. I remember watching it a few times at the end of the bar at Nelly's because and like and no atmosphere or a band playing in the background. So it's kind of nice that all this stuff is happening in the city and there's a buzz about the away games. Big time, yeah. I know. I I remember kind of always thinking before that a lot of people that went to the games maybe only followed the home games and they didn't really know about the away games but the more pubs and bars you have showing the games the better it's going to be for everyone especially with sound on as well that's the key like I know a few of them would kind of it always seems a bit sheepish and embarrassed about it like they'd stick it on at the end of the bar quietly but they didn't they didn't want to like be like balls out where Halifax Wanderers pub but I think a few of them are now like I I love watching games at Freehouse I just think it's a really nice pub Um, but yeah, it sounds like the atmosphere in Kai Brady's is incredible as well. So, yeah, really, really good that I think the city had embraced the club to a point, but now it's going another step further. Like there's more flags now. There's more attention on away games. It's, yeah, great job by the marketing department of the club, I think, to make that happen. Uh, but I, I think I think a lot of it is coming from the supporters groups themselves, because last year the club had their partner pubs and there was a kind of a bit of a push. And I found at times you'd go to the pubs that they'd listed and the game wouldn't be on. So I think that kind of, that put me off a lot of times when I'd like, and it's through no fault of the club because obviously some of the club had talked to the bars and said, hey, blah, blah, blah. And then you like, I don't know how many times like, I turned up to the pub and they'd be like, oh, we didn't even know there was a game on, that kind of stuff. It'd Whereas, usually be about seven or eight, wouldn't there? And I yeah. think, but now it's kind of been localized to just two. And there might be another one. I think Celtic Corner might still play yeah. it, but, but just like those two are the ones I think most people are going to. You know you're going to see other fans there. And it was and like, yeah. Like the, sorry, Kai Brady's like had the sound on. It was there's no like kind of distracting music out front, and mm. everybody was cheering. There was chants going. So yeah, man, it was a great time. Um, you, you want it to get to the point, don't you, where you can just kind of rock up on your own, not making any plans to meet anyone, but you know there's going to be a load of other Wanderers fans who you can sit with and chat to about the game because I'm a, I'm a big advocate for going to pubs alone, which sounds really sad, but <laughs> like it's a nice thing to do, isn't it? Like when you finish work yeah. on a Friday, just like. Right, I want to get to the boozer, have a quick pint, and just chill out for a bit. And and then if you see someone you know, happy days. But yeah, you want that. You want that environment where you can do that. And uh, like you're right there with the free house. Uh, like their back room is one of the best places in Halifax to watch football. Mm. And uh, when they put the games on, there's always like a great beer selection. And um, there's something 
quaint it. Do they still project it onto the wall? Yeah, yeah. yeah with all the flower, all the plants hanging down I, as well. It's I like that, man. I think it's, it's just it's it's something different, and yeah, I kind I kind of like it. So getting into the game here, um, just looking at the lineup first of all, like we, we kind of had big change, obviously from Forge with Rampersat and uh, Jeremy coming back in, but Sam started, and it, so what did you think of the lineup? felt exciting when I first saw it. I, I, I should have looked this up before we started recording, but I don't remember Sam Daniels and um, Salter playing as a front three, at least not starting as a front three yet. And I just remember thinking that that felt really fresh when I when I looked at the, the, the team sheet. It felt like something I hadn't seen before. Um, so, yeah, I like that. Delighted that Rampasad and Jeremy were back as well. Um, we, we kind of talked about this last week about Polisi probably the way we play now being better as an eight rather than a six. So it was good to see him there. Uh, he, to be fair, he did drop back into the six spot a few times, but mainly he was very aggressive, very high pressing eight. Uh, and I thought he was brilliant as a result. Um, and yeah, backline absolutely fine with, like we've said a million times, Charla, Restrepo, Santos, just keep on rotating those three. I know it was an enforced rotation, but keep on rotating those three, keep them all fresh. And yeah, and we, we might do something this year. Yeah, I thought um, when I saw Sam Daniels and Salter, I was like, I wonder if this is actually going to work because I don't, I don't think of Sam as being this pacey kind of winger because I guess Daniels was kind of playing that Morelli role that you kind of always kind of expect him to play all along, and I think it's one of the kind of first times you've actually seen him play that kind of like false nine kind of thing. But um, I, I thought Sam had a, an excellent game. He got himself into some really good positions and um, he was always willing to kind of push on and like make the run. So I was really surprised and impressed by him. But yeah, so Daniels... Yeah, I was going to say, with the thing I like about Sam is he's just another dribbler. And I think we, last season especially, we missed having players who carried the ball like by dribbling rather than trying to pass through the lines. It's just It's just another... It's another trick up your sleeve, isn't it? And with him and Daniels, there's just a bit more jeopardy. Like when they get the ball, they ask a few more questions of the defenders because they don't know if they're going to pass it or try and dribble past them. So, yeah, Sam is very direct and, yeah, good good close control and good dribbler. Kind of a couple of games I saw him, like he looked rusty and I, I don't know, he just kind of wasn't clicking for him. But this, I think it's the first game when he actually looked like a player and a, a, like he... I thought he was. I thought he was excellent. I thought that he uh, led the line really well, and kind of uh, even with Sammy Salter, like we had, we have we had three players, as you said, that can dribble and take a player on, which is always something we've kind of like lacked, as you said. Mm. So I mean, it was it was fantastic. Do Do you like Sam on the left? Yes, I actually thought like and I think, you know we've kind of talked before about Salter kind of playing out in the wing, but when he does play out in the wing, or and they play narrow anyway, Salter coming in from the right. He's brilliant. Like I, I think like his, um, his close control like is so much improved on last year, and he like does this injection of confidence in, in Salter is like just making him such a great player to watch. Like I, I mean, it's it's night and day to last year, mm. and like Sam, I, I think kind of was doing a lot of similar things, just like as you said, asking questions of defenders and giving people like stuff to think about and, and pressure on them. So it was fantastic, but. I kind of want to get get your thoughts on Daniels. Like, I mean, we we talk about him endlessly because we're just waiting for him to to click, and this kind of felt like yeah, it clicked. Yeah, I, I I felt the same. I thought he was good when I watched it, and then watching it back, and I was trying to pay a bit more attention to him to figure out his role. And I thought actually, no, he was brilliant. He wasn't just good. He was especially in the first half. He was brilliant. He was. He he basically played that role exactly how Morelli used to play that role, and I think they've. We've obviously stuck to the same way of playing this season um, and just been plugging people into that false nine position. But they've people have done well and worked hard and tried hard there, but they've, no one's actually been able to do it like Morelli, who was given so much license to roam. Like I, I, like, I think Morelli was basically told, go wherever you want. Like, you're good enough at football to figure this out on your own. Just do whatever you want and make it happen. And it, it worked for him. And I think the other players that have been replacing Morelli haven't been given that much license, or at least they haven't had the confidence to take that much um, license. But Daniels just seemed to decide on Saturday that he is the player we, we're aware he is, like from a talent level. And 
he, he was like sometimes he was at, he was at the center circle like next to Rampy picking out there and then the next second you'd see him on the left wing and then the next second you'd see him arriving in the box for a to score yeah brilliant all-round performance like, I thought his passing was much better much crisper and you see him as soon as he scores as well like just this weight yeah so you, can, you can see in his shoulders yeah right? and his passing like he was doing things more one touch after that um you could just see he was acting on instinct rather than overthinking things and brilliant goal as well I don't know if you want to, you plan to talk about that later but if you want to talk about that now like his goal was just yeah I, fantastic goal. I, I kind of want I just want to touch up, uh, on a point that you made about um when he was dropping back and we saw him kind of in the middle like the game against Forge we kind of talked about players that didn't appear to be making an effort and I, I think anybody who read between the lines would kind of realize who we were talking about and but like honestly like this game like he was everywhere and he was putting tackles in and you know when, when Morelli has that license to do whatever you want to he still has a role within the, the team to defend when we're when we don't have the ball and I think Daniel's like that like was brilliant at that too that it wasn't just forward I think that he was really disciplined in um how he was like tracking back and uh, gave us an extra dimension I thought when we were um when we didn't have the ball so yeah I, I agree yeah sorry um just very very quickly on that so what I've noticed recently is our false nine and I think this is quite common for false nines like their defensive responsibility is always just to sit on the other team six or if they're playing with a double pivot he'll sit on one and Jeremy will push up onto the other one and he, the, both of them did that really well against Pacific so yeah yeah great effort as well so uh, do you want to talk us through the goal? Um, it, it was. I just love that goal. I just like it was the whole thing, like the clever thinking of the the quick free kick, because uh, I, I think Sam had just got injured, injured or something like that. So I, I mm. think uh, Pacific had switched off. So you but, see, it's it's, it's kind of hard to see because obviously we know the Starlight Stadium camera angle is really shitty. Like that's no great secret, but like you can just about see Gander in the corner of the picture, and so you see Mar- Sorry, not Morelli. Jesus. <laughs> Same. Say, it's like saying your ex's name, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, darling. <laughs> I Ross, take the M. Um, no, it's like um, yeah. So you see Gander like look at look at Daniels, and Daniels straight away makes the run before Gander's even kicked it. Did it? She's kind of slow to react, and Gander beautifully flyed ball over. And it's like in the next moment, which I loved about this goal, where Daniels kind of while the ball's in midair he uses his bod so he's doing two things at once and this is blows my mind actually like one of the things he's doing is turning his body to block off Didich from making a recovery tackle whilst also angling his body so the flight of the ball lands in front of him and it's um, it's amazing when you see him do it like it's, li- it's really like shifty subtle little movements and yeah great first touch puts Didich on his ass and I mean, the, the finish was quite close to the keeper who had a bit of a nightmare, but you can forgive that because everything that came before it was was top, top level for this league. Like not yeah. many other players could have done that start to finish. I, I don't think so either. And I think you're right. Like just uh, like being able to judge the flight of the ball, the control, the the turn that, like as you said, Paul, Didic on his arse. And like Didic has been like one of the, the best defenders in the league. And you don't see that often where like, you know, somebody turns him inside out like that. And Callum Irvin did have a nightmare, but you can kind of forgive him that one because like, I don't think he was expecting it. Because if you mm. look at Daniels almost goes to faint to shoot and you can kind of see him kind of turn. So I think mm. he was just, wasn't sure of his angles because I don't think he was expecting them to turn back inside like that. So it was, it was, I, I think it's probably one of the best, Wonders goals are seen. The whole performance overall is probably one of the best Wonders performances, and it was just yeah, definitely a, a welcome tonic from the the depth and despair that we felt after Forge. But mm-hmm. just I, I kind of wanted to just, just touch a little bit um, on obviously after the Forge game, like there was a lot of negativity, like you know, and I kind of brought that up in the last one about how people were kind of muttering on the way out of the stadium, and you know, that's why I kind of reached out to Derek to have him on the show and stuff. But like, if you're Stephen Hart. Like and your Derek Martin, like this is just like it's football, so so weird, isn't it? Like I mean, we were all desperately afraid of what the fuck was going to happen out here, and then this happened. Like I mean, you got to give it to Stephen Hart. I think he got his tactics spot on. It's not. I don't think it's a problem actually. I think it's a good thing that people are always constantly talking about football because it makes all of our days a lot better. But I th- there's there's something that happens now, and this is not just a CPL or Wondrous thing. This is all levels of of sport actually, because of social media and because of 
idiots who podcast after every game to review what happened um, <laughs> <laughs> because of all it's this all your fault <laughs> I'm, I'm Mr. Positive no I know like so. both this that's both of us like talking about every game after it finishes in depth like when when people like us do that and when people talk about it in the discord or the or twitter or whatever every game becomes a referendum on the coach or a referendum on recruitment or a referendum on the direction of the club and like we all fail to look at things a bit more holistically over 10 games or 20 games or a season and every game decides whether we're shit or whether we're brilliant and I think last week against Forge we were awful and again you and I did this we sat here for an hour and talked about how shit we are and then after this it's like the absolute opposite and now I'm thinking oh you know Pacific are going to fall away if we beat Ottawa like we 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 can be third within a week maybe and it just shows you how quickly it can change um and it's interesting like the the how you can mirror this game with the forge game because i think we actually beat pacific by doing to them what forge did to us and it was almost like the exact performance that forge did but we did it this time and it worked really well and we we beat them that that, that was one of the things i was actually going to bring up like it was like pacific didn't do their homework whatsoever and didn't press high up the pitch so because like against forge the two times they put so much pressure on the back line and Rampersat, like that kind of the the kind of back line, because we're kind of used to having the ball easy enough in the back line. But like when they're when Forge was under pressure, we were rushing the pass ins, we were kind of trying to hit the corners, trying to like just do stuff that was very unwanderous. Like, and I, th- these guys just sat off as like, and it was. I, I thought their first half they were so lethargic. Like uh, mm. it was. I mean, like, I, I did want to ask you, like, I mean, like, obviously we're Wanderers fans, but Pacific have been on an awful run. And like, like, I think that's what, five games, six games now with a win or... Yeah. Um, but, like, do you think this team, like, is just lacking confidence or do you think that good coaches like Stephen Hart... Like, Stephen Hart is a good coach. Like, I, I, I have my disagreements, disagreements sometimes with the way he does stuff, but he is a good coach. But do you think that teams would just suss them out? Or do you think that it's just a confidence thing? I think they flattered to deceive at the start of the season because they had a really favourable schedule. They played, I think, like five of their first six games were at home or something, coming off a season where they finished when they won the, the championship as well. So I think that was a bit of a false flag and everyone thought they were a bit better than they are, which has made this like drop-off in form feel a bit more dramatic. Whereas I, I think they've always been this team this whole season. I think they've always been quite patchy and like I think of them I don't know how to explain I think of them as like a punk rock team where they play in like bursts they're playing like three minute bursts or one and a half bursts where they look really good but I've never seen them consistently perform that well this season when I've when I've watched them at least I think you just go from having a coach who was like he's a hugely charismatic figure isn't he um par but yeah like he's a hugely charismatic guy like has like a massive presence doesn't he when you see him like even yeah. if it comes across through the tv screen so i can't imagine what it's like in training very high standards and i have no idea if uh, merriman's a good coach or not i don't really know anything about the guy to be honest but that's a tough act to follow that's a really tough act to follow <laughs> as well as losing your best center back very good right back and I actually thought at the beginning of the season, I thought oh, they've lost McNaughton, but they've brought Didich in and he's he's good. But we're the perfect team to play against Didich because he's 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 a really good penalty box defender and he's really he'll be brilliant against like Ottawa, like where they've got two big guys. Yeah. Didich will be brilliant in those games. But when you play against a team like us with a very dynamic front three who move and interchange, I think he struggles and his mobility is found out a bit. So, yeah, they're they're. They're, they're right in it with us and Ottawa for that four, or maybe even Valor, I don't know, for that fourth spot, I think. So I, I just like like watching them. Like, I mean, I, I just like it's from the start of the season, obviously they were still riding that high of like last year, but it, it, they just look bogged down. And like, they're, they're, re- they're I guess they really miss like Manny Apparicio. And you know, obviously he's like a dynamic midfielder and stuff like that. But like, their passing, passing was so off, wasn't oh my it? God. Like, I don't know, there was at least two or three occasions when they were trying to just do simple passes out to the right wing to Marco Bussos and just didn't. And even, even he just seems off. You know what I mean? Like, like, I mean, like he had a couple of like little moments in the game and mm. like, you're right. They, they kind of do like, they're kind of playing in bursts. There's a couple of like good moments in the second half, but they didn't really create that much either. I mean, it's like there was the one that they hit the bar, like, and then I think there was one where uh, Polisi 
uh, evil Polisi. Like, um, <laughs> and look, I, I think everybody thought the goal had gone in because of the way it hit the the net. Um, but like, like it was just, yeah, it, it it's just really weird. Like, and you know, going from everybody's like favorites after the first five games, like I said, football is such a funny, fickle business that now, like Stephen Hart after this victory, everybody's like, you know, like he's this amazing, amazing manager, and like James Merriman's probably in trouble where people are probably like the fuck's going on out with the champions you know what I mean? yeah like, exactly uh, i think just a couple of things you said there like bustos i completely yeah i i've to be honest i've i've always been a bit of a bustos skeptic i've never thought he's quite as good as a lot of people say so yeah i i don't i don't i think this league is probably a ceiling i'd probably get pelters for that but i've just never seen much what like he's 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 a right he's a right winger with a good left foot like there's loads of them about i'd rather have sammy salter there doing that um, to be honest, because he's got a physical profile as well. Yeah, police, police it's funny seeing the police, wasn't it? Oh my god. Did you see it's, that picture of the three of them afterwards? Yeah, <laughs> it's like it, it looked like you know, you see like behind the scenes movie pictures of like Tom Cruise with his stunt <laughs> double. <laughs> it reminded me of that, like Marcelo <laughs> Polisi with his stunt double. Like, <laughs> oh my god, that's amazing. That's exactly it, man. It, was, it, just, it just looked like a bad science experiment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, but yeah, I, I just like, um. There was a couple of nice like little moments where the two of them kind of had a, a coming together in the middle of the pitch. And yeah, it was kind of like you, you just felt like the, there was going to be an earthquake or something. It was just like a you know it was a momentous occasion of like two two uh, immovable objects hitting each other. But <laughs> like like just flipping back to, to boost us just a little bit. Like I, I I I think he's a great player and I think he's he is probably one of the best players in the league. But last season he got hampered by a lot of injuries. Um, he was kind of in and out of team, and then and I don't know whether that's playing a little bit on his mind is that he, like he's probably afraid to because I think a lot of them are like kind of muscle injuries and he's probably just afraid to kind of you know players like that to have that bit of burst of energy like Mike alone had it like uh, you know they kind of always have hamstring injuries and, and stuff like that so I don't know whether that's playing on his mind but he just you know like Gander should have been the perfect player for him to play against because Gander is great defensively but he's not quick and uh, I, I think Gander was it absolutely brilliant he, yeah. hand, he handled everything that Busos was throwing at him it was it was a, probably his best performance I think so far I've seen in a wonder shirt and he's had a couple to be honest yeah he, he's I, I can see Gander working in stages where I don't think he's offering that's the wrong phrase because it sounds negative like but I'm going to say like he doesn't he doesn't offer us a huge amount in the attacking phases but I don't think that's a problem because I think uh, like again reading the tea leaves a bit I think the coaching staff are just going get yourself settled and sorted defensively like that is your first job in this team to be a good left back defender and then once you've kind of got that mastered then we'll worry about like attacking runs overlaps down the left side because we attack down our right a lot more than we attack down our left and we always have done like, I don't know if that's a Stephen Hart thing or a personnel thing but we always kind of really heavily weighted towards attacking down the right so Gander can just be a left back a defensive left back which is is fine now and yeah he really did well against Bustos which uh, I think we can probably all admit that we we looked at that and went that could be a bit a bit dicey yeah. but he I don't I don't think he was ever really that threatened by him because I thought that like uh for, for this game we would have brought in Tabby with his pace and stuff for that um to mm. kind of uh, counteract that but it goes to show you like that Stephen Hart really is starting to trust Gander and like Gander's kind of pretty much made that left back slot his own at this stage, which uh, is fantastic. But he, he does the thing you you talk about this a lot, but like the the tucking inside to kind of make a back three when because Fernandez is incredibly attacking. Yeah. So every time he goes forward, like you always say, like Gander just tucks in to form a back three, so we're a bit more solid there, um, which works. It, it works well. I'd never noticed it till you said, but yeah, it does happen every match. I want to talk a little bit about uh, obviously man of the moment, Sammy Salter. So first of all, Sammy what do you, fucking so uh, what 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 do you think of? Uh, um, uh, I don't know if you caught this on the commentary, but uh, Adam Jenkins uh has come up with a new nickname for Sammy Salter. Obviously everybody knows him as Sammy fucking Salter, but his nickname for him was Salty. Uh, cause Sal- he had because he had that like little push and match with uh every match he has a little push yeah, and match. So he's like, like, oh, it's, it's, it's an easy way to go, but like he is kind of <laughs> salty. And I was just like, dude, come on, he's Sammy fucking salty. Sammy fucking, or like if you're feeling lazy, it's Sammy Salts. And that's it. <laughs> 
go on, Sammy Salts. <laughs> <laughs> Whichever you want, but he's not salty. But I love it. He, every match now, he gets in a little push it, pushing. Well, and he, he kind of like if you ever like if you ever talk to him or if you like, he's so unassuming, and it's kind of funny how those kind of unassuming guys like are once they get on the pitch, it's like Mark Hughes, like Mark Hughes was like. <laughs> the quietest man in the world yeah. stick on a football pitch and he turned into a beast and it's just uh, the same as Sammy Salter have you, have you have you interviewed you've interviewed Salter haven't yeah. you yeah was, mean, he, was he chatty or he, he literally just signed and uh, it, was, okay. it was during the bubble and he's as I said he's a really kind of quiet guy but I mean like um he's he's definitely focused and a lot of people like I was talking to Angus McNabb before he signed for us and he was saying that he actually rated Salter quite a lot Okay. And after last season, I was like, this guy doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about. And then <laughs> he proved me wrong. Like, yeah. also, like Agnes, despite what's happened to York right now, kind of knows what he's, what he's what he's up to, you know? Mate, so. look look up look up pictures of Salter when he was playing um, university. So when he was playing university, he had long hair and he is the spitting image for Andy Carroll. <laughs> You're kidding me. I, nah, I, mate, I, honestly, I, spitting image. I, 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 I kind of pictured him of having like something similar to Polisi, like a kind of dyed blo- or like frosted tips or something. Yeah, <laughs> kind of, he has that kind of vibe about him. But I did want to just, I just want to just, I did want to talk about uh, the the penalty, um, how he kind of um, set that up. But his, his close control again, like I mean, like he he totally like bamboozled uh, Sean Young for that, and I kind of liked how. He just grabbed the fucking ball as soon as mm. you know, like there was nobody who was going to take that penalty apart from him. But it, it was such a it was, it was a penalty or nothing really. Um, and yeah, his, his control was just phenomenal, and then the penalty itself was just. He's getting is he getting to that point like like Iron Robin that he's the cliche, isn't he? For where you know exactly what he's going to do, he's going to get that ball on the right hand side and he's going to shift it onto his left foot every single time. Like I can't think of a single time he's ever gone around the outside and like beat his man. It's, it's never happened and it never will happen. That's it. Like, can, you, can you picture that in your head? Like him head down, like beating him for pace around the outside because I can't. Definitely not. Definitely, it's never going to happen. And I'm so, sure. So- I'm but sure the like, left back uh, knows what he's going to do as well, but you can't stop it. That's the thing, though. That was the same thing with like Arian Robin, the exact same thing that like you knew exactly what the fucker was going to do, but sometimes you're just powerless to stop it. But like Sean Young, in his defense, I guess, had just come on, I suppose, and mm. was a little bit kind of slow getting into it. But it was just, I, I watched it again today. He won the ball in a tackle, and then his close control was beautiful. And it was, it was just asking for somebody. To stick a leg out and, and do it, but I also wanted to give a, a shout out to the uh, to the annoying fucker in behind the goal with the Vuvuzela. Did just did he catch mm. that guy when he was taking the penalty? I, I could hear, I could hear um, bagpipes the whole game. As oh well. my god, yeah, that, that was odd. But like, well, it's, it's been tattoo the tattoo thing here this weekend, hasn't it? So when I was watching the game, I thought I could hear something from downtown. <laughs> I live downtown. I thought I could hear something from that, but it or on the replay, I was like, oh no, it was actually there. The fucking loudest bagpipes in the world. <laughs> no, it has. Because there's a guy when Salt was trying to take the, the penalty. Somebody was in behind the goal, like, and he was like giving them the gears, and then he, he mm. blew into a view. Where the fuck? Like, I thought those things were banned. And it was they should a pur- be banned. It was a fucking purple one, too. So obviously, like, the Pacific are selling the fucking things. But that's Mate, why Salt pri- after- Prison sentence. Yeah. If, if, I, if you catch someone <laughs> in prison sentence, they're the and worst why, things. I think that's football. why Salter did the. Uh, you know, the shush celebration afterwards because okay. that guy's been fucking super annoying. Can we, can we just do a pen? Sorry, really quickly, like how good our penalty record is. It's fucking, somebody, somebody pointed this out to me, actually. I think it was after here, Garcia had scored against uh, York that we've never missed one. No, we've, we've had 16 penalties and we've never missed a penalty, which is outrageous because the, 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 the scoring rate for penalties is like 75% or something. So hypothetically, we should have missed at least maths five penalties, six penalties. But we, ha- hell. I know, mate. I'm touching my desk here, I'm touching some wood because it, it, I don't want to. In fairness, it, we've but... had some really good penalty takers. Like, like Garcia. Yeah. Garcia is a really good penalty taker. Morelli, phenomenal. Who, who took them in season one? Was it Garcia? Uh, per- Perea. Pereira, yeah. and I think Karuma had one as well, but Pereira was a fantastic penalty taker too. And, and Sammy Salter, like, you know, Callum Irvin's like, like a part, I know this performance didn't really show up, but it was one of the best goalkeepers in the mm. league. And it, it, it's just, it's just everything he's touching right now is gold. And I hope yeah. it really continues for him. Like, I mean, he's second in the, the scoring charts now. Like, uh, uh, Diaz doesn't look like he's going to be scoring anytime soon. Um, the only one that's probably going to give him a run for his money is uh, that Peppel kid from 
Calvary, who's been on a, yeah. a chart since he came back into the league. But mm. so, um, I, I did want to just quickly talk, just touch on like our game management because it's always been a bit of a criticism of the team sometimes that they don't see out games properly. But Rampersat and Sam, I think it was around like the 60th minute, like they did, uh, Sam went up for like a, a Peter Pichala just cleared the ball after somebody had had a shot. I think it might have been Bustos. And the ball was coming and did it. Literally, like, touched the back of, of Sam and he, like, did this theatrical dive and stuff like that. But just it just released that ounce of pressure. It was a real, really good time that that happened. And then Rampersat did it, the same thing. And R- Rampy's air player. And, like, obviously... If somebody else was playing against him, they'd probably say that he's a shit house like Becker because he's mm. he's really good at taking a bit of contact and falling over, yeah. especially for the size of him. And he did the same thing with the Jamar Dixon. We were under pressure, and they just had a really good chance. And uh, he like got the slightest of nudges and just went over. And was, I just thought like those little moments kind of just disrupted their play because they were kind of coming into it ever so slightly in the second half. I think they must have had a rocket in the second half, and they were kind of a little bit better. I just thought we controlled the game better than we normally do when we kind of... There, there's no time in that second half and I thought, we're going to fucking blow this. Even when we were 2-0 up, I was just like... I just thought we had complete control of the game and I thought it was the game management was fantastic. Mm, yeah. I think when I want to see Rampersad do stuff like that, I want to see Sam do stuff like that. I think good. I know, good, right? like, we, How many times before have we said, like, we're a bit nice and we're like, we're, we're like kind of a team of players you'd probably... You want your daughter to marry, but oh, we want them to be a bit more dickheady and yeah. assholes. And and I've got I've like, I have absolutely no problem with diving and stuff. I know that's a very unpopular thing to say, especially in North America. But like, I think the reason teams do stuff like that is because they have such a will to win. Like an individual player is happy to go. I'm going to look stupid on TV here because everyone's going to see that I've dived, but I want my team to win this much. So I'm going to do that. And that's absolutely fine. I want players like that. I don't want players who are like, no, nah, I'm a man. I'm not going to dive. Like I want players who are going to cheat to help us <laughs> win, quite frankly. <laughs> and that's absolutely well, fine with me. <laughs> that's that's the most English thing I've ever heard you say, man. So there you go. No, it's like, like it's, it's part of the game. And like, I know people dislike it and, but it's like, it's just, as I said, in those kind of moments, like like it's it's been professional, and it's like did it did put his hand on his back, so what it was technically a foul, I guess, uh, but he just made it look a little bit more, and there, like yeah. I, I thought the referee was very uh, naive, um, like he had a he had a good game actually, but I just thought those little moments he was kind of naive, but yeah, I, it's anybody- just, it just shows us learning from Forge again, I think, because again, Forge were doing all of that stuff to us last week, and I'm sure we've looked at the tape of that game and gone, we need to be doing more of this dickhead stuff, and yeah. Oh, big Long time! Continue. But, but anybody who wants to see a awful, awful dive, I think it was around the 60th minute when Sam did his. It was uh, <laughs> <laughs> even I think Adam Jenkins actually brought it up. He's like, yeah. "Oh, come on!" He didn't even. I was just like, <laughs> "He's a simulation, <laughs> didn't he?" <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. So you know, look, looking towards uh, a Thursday and a game against uh, Ottawa. Every game now seems like it's uh, like we're getting to that kind of part of the season I guess where like everything matters like I mean how do you think we're going to do because like you know Ottawa we've kind of mentioned like on like before that they're kind of hit and miss you know like they they beat teams and they get hammered by Valor they lose away to Edmonton so what what, what way would you kind of go into this game because obviously we're going to have tired players because there was like travel issues on the weekend I think that the boys got stuck in um mm. Calgary for six hours, which sounds like my idea of fucking hell, to be honest. Yeah, overnight at the airport yeah. on going into Friday morning, which again puts within that context, that performance becomes even more impressive when you know they basically had no sleep 48 hours before the game. And yeah. And crazy, right? So yeah, what, what do you what do you think we need to do um against Ottawa to try and get away with the, the three points here? I think this is a massive game on Thursday. I think I don't know if like people have been paying that much attention to the table, but it's it's a huge it's the biggest game of our season. Like we are, I think we always had that the Ottawa game circled because like we keep saying like I think it's us and them, and I think now Pacific as well, but certainly us and Ottawa who gets that fourth place. And if we if we beat them, we overtake them in the table, and we overtake Pacific in the table, and we're third. And I don't know how that's happened, quite frankly, <laughs> um, but we are third, and we're in a really really good spot. And I think it's just you want to see a start to have some sort of consistency because we've not won two games on a bounce on the bounce yet. 
and it'd be nice to like get a bit of a run like teams forge and cavalry aside teams don't really go on runs in this league like yeah. every every team is inconsistent except for those two so it'd be nice for us to like even just put three or four wins together and you you do that and you're in an absolutely phenomenal position in the table i totally agree i think um this is like a big big like these are the games we need to win at home like the forge Forge and Calvary are going to do their own thing. I think they're going to be like gone. Like, I mean, Calvary are on a five game winning streak at this stage. So, I mean, like, they're kind of like out of sight. But this, these are the kind of games that we need to pick up the wins at home. Like, a draw, mm. okay, but like, we really need to. Uh, and I, we kind of owe them one as well. Like, I, I, there's something annoying about Ottawa. The fans, <laughs> the fans are fucking annoying. And yeah, it's. <laughs> They've like, completely nicked that West. You know, the, all the West Ham fans for years have been doing the We Are Massive thing. Like, yeah. I, I think their fans have just completely nicked that from West Ham and kind of, yeah. It's like, like, let's be honest here. There's like one stand in that big stadium where they all are. <laughs> like, yeah, you, you're, you're so massive. You don't even like fill one side of the stadium. But anyway, um, I, I, I just. For people who haven't checked it out, um, you, you've just released a new um, uh, article with uh, Matt Fegan. So what, what were your big takeaways from, from that and where can people check it out? Yeah, so like everything I write, it's on fromaways.com. Um, really good. Like I've, I've done stuff with Matt before. I think he's a really open and he's very open. He's a really interesting guy to talk to. I think you've had him on the podcast as well, yeah. haven't you? Like he gives really, really in-depth detailed answers i think i think he's very conscious of being transparent and he's very aware that that is an attribute rather than something to be protected um so he's always really willing to engage and yeah some interesting stuff especially about like the under 23s and how to be announced soon i believe there's going to be an under 23 game against um plslq team um and he also said in the interview that we had one set up with hibernian from scotland with their under 23s but um because hibs qualified for the europa league they had to kind of redirect their travel budget to that instead so that would have been great if that happened that would have been awesome yeah yeah um i think he's got a few connections with teams in scotland because he said some stuff before about players they've been looking at in scotland and partnerships and stuff so he's scottish himself isn't he i <sighs> I think he's, I think he might be, yeah. yeah I know, he, I, think he, I think he grew up all over. I think he grew up a bit in England, a bit in Scotland, a lot in Canada. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think he's got some connections there. So, yeah, always interesting. And, like, it, hearing him kind of talking about squad building as well and what I thought was interesting was how he kind of tied into how now we've got a very defined way of playing. It makes it much easier for him from a recruitment perspective to identify players who fit into that system rather than just getting a bunch of good players together and trying to figure it out afterwards. Um, so yeah, enjoyed it. And you had your, you had your Derek interview as well, which was kind of around the same time, I think, wasn't it? Yeah. It was kind of like uh, anybody who, whoever listened to it, I, I think Derek is like, and I think Matt as well, like they're really good PR people. Like, you know, I think there was a kind of a rain cloud, like a storm cloud around the place after the Forge game. Because, I mean, it's the second heavy defeat to Forge in space for a month. Uh, a lot of people were kind of questioning on Twitter the direction of some of this stuff. And I, I think sometimes it's good to get, rather than us all speculating about how stuff works, is to ask people, <laughs> like, you know what I mean? And I think that's one of the great things about Derek and uh matt is that like they're generally pretty open about what's going on with the club and how they see stuff and um i i i really appreciate like how how open they are and i i really enjoy talk i think derek's a great great guy to talk to like he's really kind of open about the fact that he's not a soccer guy like he hasn't come to that background so he's learning as he goes along and i think that's where matt and steven and stuff like that really help out by guiding him sometimes in the way that he wants mm. to, like Derek, Derek will fill the stadium I think no matter what because yeah that's what he does he's a great businessman and he's a great promoter and um I, I think sometimes he just needs that little bit of help with the, the football side of it and I think having Matt and um Stephen there to kind of guide him is, is really helped and just hearing the plans that they kind of have for the stadium and stuff for like that just sounds amazing yeah and like you know what I, I I think that um, the city needs something like that. Like mm. we're, we're quite, like if 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 we have these grandiose plans to be th this up and coming uh, city, we need a better transport transit system. We need stadiums. We need facilities because that's what attracts people and that's what attracts businesses and attracts whatever is to have in those kind yeah. of facilities. So I really hope that 
the stadium comes along, like I, I think we need it because De- Derek kind of made a point of like how you know we kind of all muck in and you know we we deal with the porta potties and we deal with whatever that kind of gets thrown at us at the at, at the wonders grounds. But you can only put up with that for so long. And I think mm. you know the kind of nice the nice part where we're all kind of like you know mucking in and getting along with it. It will only go so far, and you kind of you're going to get sick of it. You know, not having running water and not having with proper toilets and all that kind of stuff. We need to have that. And I think the fans, yeah. the city of Halifax is there. And it's not just like from a football side of things. It's like having rugby players, rugby teams coming in and maybe hosting a couple of like, like, you know, the championship games for like the, the universities and stuff like that. So, yeah, yeah I um, agreed with what you, I, you said in the interview. I think you said you moved here in 2010, didn't you, to yeah. Canada? And I remember, and I agree, I moved here in late 2016 and I was the same as you I because I live very close to the grounds and I just walk past it a lot and think, what the fuck is this space? Like, why is this so wasted? This is in a brilliant spot and nothing happens here. And I know um, whatever that Friends of the Halifax Common, they're like very protective over that space, but I don't, don't think they were doing anything with it before. Or Like, like heaven forbid, like it was like a, an empty space where, uh, as I mentioned on the thing where uh, an, an American football or Canadian football goal on it, but like nobody was using it because like the, the, the pitch was awful and like there's so much red tape, like you can't just like rock up there and, like do whatever because it was always locked. Mm. So it was just this is barren land. So I don't I, I don't quite get the argument of well you're destroying the space like the space wasn't being used for anything. Exactly. So I mean why not like if if that piece of land is supposed to be for everybody like the stadium just makes sense that like you know there's six and a half thousand people that weren't on that before are now Mm. using it every week you know exactly every two weeks so like ask any any ask any business in the vicinity of the grounds if they're happy about that being there and though they are delighted because they make a lot of money on match days like walk past it on a saturday and tell me that's not a good thing for this city it's it's a like a ludicrous argument to say it's not because it so evidently is and it's successful and it's working as well like like we sell out most weeks or can come close to it like it's, it's a no-brainer. I think I think it will happen. I think like there's, there's surely people aren't that dense to not want this to become. You'd be surprised, but but that's yeah. the thing though. Like like I, I can understand if they were selling the land off for apartments or you know, because that's where every spare scrap of land right now is going for apartments because the city's mm. getting bigger and people are moving here. But that they're not. They're using it for something that's good for the city. So yeah, I hope that common sense prevails unfortunately in life that doesn't always happen um but yeah man uh let's uh let's wrap up there and uh thursday let's do it folks please wait folks please time to drink on folks get out out to 